Hi, we just finished the first part of chapter 12 dealing with torque and uh, we're in our last section um, leading up to the final and you may, you know, at this point in the semester you may start feeling a little bit pressured. You have to get all this done, all your instructors are pushing more and more material at you to try to finish up the subject matter for the semester and you got finals coming up and so we got a picture here just to test um, what state of mind you might be in at this moment. You should be able to see that there are two happy dolphins flying out of the water here. And if you are in a relaxed, uh, happy state of mind, then, uh, then, then that is the kind of image that you should see. Some people under stress might see something different than the uh, two dolphins that you should see in this picture. Um, so you should be concerned. If you see anything other than the happy dolphins jumping out of the water, then uh, maybe you should take it a little bit easier and, um, and relieve yourself of some of that pressure. But they do look pretty happy, the two dolphins there. So this is one test of whether or not you might be under stress. Physicists have a way of quantifying stress, and it looks something like this. Normally, we assume that rigid bodies are undeformed, but in reality, all objects are deformable. In other words, if we had a rigid body, let's say this meter stick, if we apply a force on it, then we normally assume that either that force is going to translate it or it's going to rotate it, but it's not going to do anything to the rigid body itself. Well, that's not true. In reality, all objects in a macroscopic sense are indeed deformable, so we need to deal with that. It turns out that stress is proportional to the force causing the deformation, and it is, in fact, the force per unit cross-sectional area. So if I apply a force on an area, then I define stress as the force per area that I'm applying it. Or if I did it lengthwise, I could apply a force along the length of this meter stick per cross-sectional area of the meter stick, and that would be a stress along the length of the meter stick. This person obviously is under stress, and the way I know that is that they're actually applying a force on a cross-sectional area. In fact, they're applying two forces on two cross-sectional areas, and that is, that is a stress. A force per area is indeed a stress on each side of their head. So that's how we define it. Stress is force per area. Well, you've been working hard. You might be under a little bit of stress, but you've been staying up late, working on your physics problems, making sure you understand all the problems in the problem set, and you're burning the midnight oil and your eyes get tired and after a while you might feel a little bit strained. Well, we have a way of quantifying strain in physics as well. Strain is a measure of the degree of deformation after you apply, in a sense, a stress. Strain has no units. For instance, we have what we define as tensile strain, which is the change in uh, length of something in relation to its original length given a stress. So again, using this meter stick as an example, if I were to apply a stress and I were actually to pull on this meter stick over its cross-sectional area, then it might change a certain length in relation to its original length. That change in length per its original length is what I call the strain. Now the units of this would be meters over meters, so that would be unitless. There would be no units on the strain. In fact, there are no units on any of the strain examples that we're going to be talking about. It's simply a uh, ratio of how much it changed to the original amount. We define shear strain as how much a two-dimensional object will shear in this sense of a delta x in relation to the distance between the couple that caused the shear. In other words, the couple is two forces in opposite directions with a distance between them, and that causes a shear, in this case delta x. Those units also will be meters over meters, hence the shear strain, which is a two-dimensional idea, actually has 
uh, no units as all, at all as well, just unitless. And we could have a volume strain. A volume strain is if we applied a stress on the volume of something and it reduced its volume to a lesser volume. So the final volume would be less than the initial volume. And that change in volume over the original volume would be our volume strain. Again, no units because this would be meters cubed over meters cubed. And hence, they would cancel out and have no, no units for our strain. So here's an example of stress and strain. Here's Sylvester before work. And you apply a stress on him, a force per area on him. And as a result of that cause, we have a volume strain, a change in volume as opposed to the original volume. That would be the strain. So we have a cause and effect, the stress and the strain. For small stresses, the stress is proportional to the strain. The proportionality constant is called the elastic modulus. So we define the elastic modulus as being the stress divided by the strain. I like to think of it as the cause over the effect. The stress over the strain is the cause over the effect. We will consider three types of elastic moduli, and these will be, indeed, intrinsic properties of materials. We have Young's modulus, which would be in a linear sense, the shear modulus, which is a two-dimensional sense, and the bulk modulus, which is a three-dimensional volume type stress and strain. So for Young's modulus, we measure the resistance of a solid to a change in its length. It is the tensile stress over the tensile strain. So given a one-dimensional object like this meter stick, the Young's modulus would be the stress, the force per cross-sectional area that I might apply along its length, divided by the strain that results from that, the change in length in relation to its original length. So it is cause over the effect, stress, over the strain. The shear modulus measures the resistance of motion of planes of a solid sliding past one another. It is the shear stress over the shear strain, force per area, over the shear strain, how much it sheared, delta x, over the distance between the two forces of the couple. The bulk modulus is the resistance of solids or liquids to changes in their volume. The bulk modulus is equal to the volume stress over the volume strain. So if we applied a three-dimensional stress on an object and reduced in size, then it would be that stress, force per area, over the strain, the change in volume over volume. This is the only one that has a negative sign out front because we know that if we applied a three-dimensional stress on something and it reduced its volume, its final volume would be less than its initial volume, and delta V here would be a negative quantity. So in order to keep the bulk modulus as a positive quantity, we put a negative sign up front. So these are indeed mechanical properties of different materials, and they are something that might help us identify a material, the uh, Young's modulus, shear modulus, or bulk modulus. Let's try it out. A load of 102 kilograms is su supported by a wire of length 2 meters and cross-sectional area 0.1 square centimeters. The wire is stretched by 0.22 centimeters. Find the tensile stress, the tensile strain, and Young's modulus for this wire. All right, well, the stress is going to be the force applied over the cross-sectional area of the wire, and that's going to be equal to the weight over the area. The weight would be mg divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. Our mass was 102 kilograms. G is 9.8, so that will give us the weight. And the cross-sectional area we are given as 0.1 square centimeters, so that will be 0.1 times 10 to the minus 4 square meters giving us a stress 
of 1 times 10 to the 8 newtons per meter squared. And that indeed will be the units of stress, newtons per meter squared. Our strain, in this case tensile strain, will be the change in length of the wire to the original length of the wire. We're told that it's stretched 0.22 centimeters, which is 0 0.0022 meters, and the original length was two meters, so the meters cancels out. And our strain, our strain is 1.1 times 10 to the minus three. No units on that, or no units on any strain. It's always the change of something over the original something. Hence, our Young's modulus for this wire is the stress over the strain, the cause over the effect. One times 10 to the eight over 1.1 times 10 to the minus three, 9.1 times 10 to the 10 newtons per meter squared. So this should be an intrinsic property of this wire, whatever this wire could be. It could be a steel wire, it could be copper, it could be silver, gold, it could be aluminum, it could be um, something like that, steel. Um, so you might look up in, in the book, and in fact, if you look up in your book, um, in chapter 12, table, the first table, tw table 12.1, actually has a table of Young's moduli and shear modulus and bulk modulus. As I look in this table, there are a number of uh, moduli for the different substances. And I'm looking down this table and I find that there is a substance that has a Young's modulus of 9.1 times 10 to the 10, and that happens to be brass. So I might be pretty confident that the wire that this is made out of is actually made out of brass. It could help me identify the substance. Something else I might notice from this table for common substances, this table in particular has tungsten, steel, copper, brass, aluminum, glass, quartz, water, mercury. If for substances like this, if I were to calculate the moduli, the elastic modulus, either Young's, shear, or bulk, I would find that the modulus would be on the order of 10 to the 10. So it's some number times 10 to the 10. In fact, for something like steel, it's 20 times 10 to the 10. Brass is 9.1 times 10 to the 10. Uh, aluminum is 7 times 10 to the 10. Quartz is 5.6 times 10 to the 10. It's going to be something times 10 to the 10 newtons per meter squared. So if I were making a calculation of a modulus for some common material like this, and I come up with something like you know, 7 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared, maybe I've made a mistake somewhere, because I'm going to expect that the modulus should be on the order of something times 10 to the 10. So keep that in mind if it's a common substance. Now, if it were like nylon rope or something like that, which is really stretchy, then you're going to get a much different result. But if it's a common material, you should expect that the modulus is on the order of 10 to the 10. All right, so that's just a nice introduction to elastic modulus. And um, that's pretty much my lecture. Um, I have a screen that really didn't make the final cut, but it may be something worth showing you since it could be interesting. If you really truly were stressed, you should know that the word stressed is desserts spelled backwards. How about that? So if you can remember that, and if you got stressed out, it's really desserts spelled backwards, and if you think of a desserts, then you can kind of reverse your stress, hopefully. The way I see this is here we have a cross-sectional area with a force. Force per area is stress. So there you have it, stress. So that concludes this second lecture of chapter 12, dealing with elastic modulus.